Let the church say amen. amen. We give God praise today for an opportunity to be in the house of the Lord on this early Good Friday morning. I would that you would turn your Bibles to the New Testament book of John chapter 19, beginning at verse 26. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing of his word. On Tuesday, April 8th, in this year, a man by the name of Jonathan Fleming was released from jail after having served 24 years and eight months for a crime that he did not commit. From the beginning, Fleming had an alibi at the time of the alleged crime. He was in Florida with his family at Disney World and had the proof that would substantiate his whereabouts. But of course, that proof was intentionally withheld. For almost 25 years, this man had tried to be heard, but some ambitious prosecutors and corrupt investigators were not interested in the truth. They simply wanted a conviction, and they were sinister enough to send an innocent man to jail without an ounce of shame or remorse. And so on that Tuesday, a whole lot of us rejoiced as we saw Mr. Fleming released from his bondage. I'm sure that most of us in here were happy for Mr. Fleming, but I will confess to you that my heart rejoiced for his mother, Patricia, the woman who just hugged him and cried with joy when she saw her son's sentence vacated. You see, this woman, this mother, had to see her son punished for a crime that he did not commit. But on that day, she had the privilege of seeing him released. And she was elated, to say the least. And as I watched the television screen, Reverend Barbara, this, seeing this woman made me think of other mothers who've had to endure the false conviction and the sentencing of their sons outside the courtroom. I thought of Mamie Till Bradley, the mother of Emmett Till, who was sentenced to death by racist citizens who claimed that his crime was whistling at a white woman. I thought of Sabrina Fulton, the mother of Trayvon Martin, who was executed by a crazed, self-appointed vigilante by the name of George Zimmerman, and then having to see his executioner go free. And then there is uh, Lucia McBath, the mother of Jordan Davis, the teen who was murdered by an arrogant and callous Michael Dunn, who was also exonerated by the courts after deciding that Davis's loud music warranted a death sentence. Who does not grieve with mothers and, yes, fathers, who've had to endure the brutal killings and illegal sentencing of their sons? and the unjust verdicts of their son's murderers, all because it seems that demonic forces are forever moving to kill and oppress those who are the wrong color or who are viewed as deserving prey. When we think of mothers, my heart also goes back to Mary, the mother of Jesus. You see, I know that if I had been in Jerusalem that day, if we had been there, some of our hearts would have broken as we watched Jesus having to drink 
from the cup of suffering and degradation. When they nailed his hands and his feet to the old rugged cross, when they hung him high and stretched him wide, when he cried out in agony, our hearts would have been filled with pain, compassion, and utter remorse to watch this savior of the world die such an agonizing death. I know that I would have fallen apart, but I also know this, that when my eyes fell on Mary, standing very close to that cross, weeping for her son, with an invisible sword piercing her soul, I know that I would have known a heartbreak that would have turned my very life. See, this woman, this mother, Mary, surely knew about suffering. She had suffered shame and ridicule just bringing Jesus into the world. She had endured threats on his life, and you know the story. She had to flee from Bethlehem to get her baby away from the sword of Herod. And then she got the word that innocent children had died because Herod was trying to do everything he could uh, uh, to wipe out the king. Surely, Mary, seeing so many reject and persecute her son through the years, had not had an easy life. But this moment was the pinnacle of her maternal suffering. See, it was not just that her firstborn was dying. It was the way he was dying, hanging on a cross, openly, publicly, and shamefully. But the paradox of this moment, church, is that in the midst of his dying, after having forgiven his enemies, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. After having opened the doors of to eternity, uh, of eternity to the thief hanging next to him on the cross. Jesus now turns his attention to his mother and John, the only disciple who seems to have remained. So many others had run away to hide. The others did not want to be identified with him in that hour. But John stayed there because his love would not let him abandon Jesus. Church, their presence at the cross reminds us that standing with Jesus will not always be easy, but it is what we must do. We who call ourselves Christian have a responsibility to love him and to live for him in spite of the fact that it's not always easy, it's not always popular, and it's not always comfortable. As we look at what is happening in the church in this 21st century, we can see that too many Christians have deserted Christ, just as his disciples did of that day. There are those who, who have allowed culture to shape their character, and they've walked away from Christ's call to holiness and Christian accountability. There are many in the church who will sing, Jesus, keep me near the cross, but they are more attached to the notion of self-gratification and the opinion of others than they are the cross of Christ. We have preachers and choir members and church mothers who have failed to embrace biblical paradigms, and they are, they are essentially lacking in the commitment, the faith, and the desire to stand with Jesus. They're more invested in church or denominational politics than they are invested in being kept by Jesus. They'd rather obey the dictates of their flesh. They'd rather follow Beyonce or Jay-Z instead of the word of God. We've got folk in the church 
who want to shout, but they don't want to deal with the notion of sacrifice knowing that in order to follow Jesus, uh, sometimes uh, 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 you have to take up your cross uh, and you have to walk the straight and narrow because the Jesus said, if you love me, then you'll be uh, 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 prone and you'll be quick to obey God. Too many in the church suffer from a spiritual disorientation and a diluted theology that keeps us unaligned with the Jesus who died for us. And because many have become the church of culture instead of the church of Christ, we stand in danger of losing our true connection to the cross. But can I tell you this morning, church, we need to stay near the cross because apart from the cross, we will miss out on eternity. Apart from the cross, we will hate our enemies and look for ways to retaliate and subsequently lose our souls to the evil one. Stay near the cross because apart from the cross, you won't have the power to get back up again when life knocks you down. Apart from the cross, you can never find the power to overcome evil and keep on living when trouble seeks to steal your life. Or if you don't stay near the cross, you won't be able to maintain your sanity when it's obvious that you should have lost your mind. Or stay near the cross because at the cross, there's power to overcome darkness and walk in the light. At the cross, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all, somebody say all, all their guilty stains. Why don't you put your hands together this morning and thank God for the cross. And the Bible lets us see that John was not like the other disciples. You see, John had a different spirit. He had been with Jesus when he fed the 10,000 on the mountainside. He had been with Jesus when he healed the lepers and raised Lazarus from the dead. He had been with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration and even in the Garden of Gethsemane. John had been the one who had just leaned his head on Jesus' breast during the Last Supper. And because he had been with Jesus, he understood that now was not the time for him to flee. And he decided that he would stay with Jesus while Jesus hung on the cross. He had decided that he would give Jesus his whole heart. And while I'm sure that he was afraid on that Good Friday, he was not too afraid to stay. He remained and showed Jesus and Mary that while they may not have been able to count on Peter, they couldn't find Thaddeus or Bartholomew anywhere, that they would be able to count on him. And so the Bible says that when Jesus saw John and when he saw his mother, there was one thing that he knew he had to do. Lifting his head, when he saw his mother and the pain on her face, is it any wonder, church, that with the agony ripping through his shredded body, only being, uh, 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 he, he, he felt a whole lot of pain. But that pain was only surpassed 
by the pain that he must have felt when he gazed on his heartbroken mother, uh, is it any wonder that he would reach out to the one disciple on whom he could depend? And so mustering up all of the energy he could, he speaks one more time and cries out, woman, behold your son. This is truly an unparalleled characteristic of our Savior. But you see, whenever there is a need, can I get a witness that the Lord will supply your every need? Where there is lack, can I get a witness? He will send the fullness of his love and to the person that feels that God is not concerned. Just hang on in there a little while longer because the songwriter said, be not dismayed, whatever be time, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. You ought to turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, he is Jehovah Jireh, the God who will provide. He's bread in a starving land. He's water for the thirsty. He's love for the unloved. He'll pick you up He'll turn you around. He'll place your feet on solid ground. He will not leave you by yourself. He is the provider. Hallelujah. And then he turns to, his, uh, to John and says, John, Behold your mother. He says to John, Lord have mercy. I need you to pick up where I'm leaving off because you stayed near the cross. I believe that this mantle, Lord have mercy, that's on me, I'm now transferring to you. I'm not just calling you John to take care of my mother, but I'm calling you to take up the continuation of my ministry. John, preach the gospel until folks get saved. John, call men and women to repentance so their lives can be turned around. John, expand the kingdom of God just as you've taken your stand at the foot of the cross, I'm calling you, John, to go higher and understand that it is from this day forward that you will become, uh, uh, your, your ministry will take on a different dimension. And so, church, as I go to my seat, I hear the Lord speaking to us, declaring on this Good Friday that we are not here just to celebrate the work that Jesus died on Calvary, but we're here to get an assignment. And that assignment is to stay near the cross of Jesus Christ. I don't care what this 21st century culture tells us. There's still power at the cross of Jesus. At last and did my Savior bleed and did my sovereign die. Stay near the cross because life swallowed up death at the cross of Jesus. Stay near the cross, saints, because we are reconciled back to God by the cross. There is a refreshing for the soul 
at the cross of Jesus Christ. Stay near the cross because it was on the cross that he shed his blood for me. And guess what? The blood of Jesus still has power. There's power in the blood. Wonder working power. The blood of Jesus cover you. The blood of Jesus cover your children. The blood of Jesus cover your grandchildren. The blood of Jesus cover your church. The blood of Jesus give you the power to tread on serpents. The blood of Jesus keep your heart, keep your mind. The blood of Jesus. 